Side Broadcast, the best Vox casting either side of the breach. While Bertrand Venn stood up beside the bar with an inch of whiskey, waxing lyrical to his captive audience, Marion slid out through the swing doors and down to the wagon. It had been no effort at all to get him talking when the distinguished salesman and inventor retired to the gold tooth for supper. Marion had asked the first question and allowed the townsfolk's natural curiosity to do the rest. Venn was only too happy to talk about himself. Marion suspected he'd be just as happy talking to a mirror. It was growing dark outside. The clouds were back, although not the same purple and black curds that had drenched Red Row the night before. Tonight they were more like smoke, blotting out the fading sun and lending wealth to Marion's endeavor. Although the wagon wasn't more than ten feet wide, it was thirty feet long, and at least half that in height, and more than likely two stories inside. The only entrance he could find was a narrow door on the back wall made of plain wood, with an inset gold hoop for a handle. Venn had folded away the table and carried his unsold treasures back into the wagon when the crowd began to thin, but Marion had been watching from the saloon porch and hadn't seen any sort of lock on the wagon door. Sure enough, when he plucked out the hoop with a finger and twisted it, the door unlatched and swung outwards. He struck a sulfur match and lit his bullseye lantern, leaving the brass cover closed until he'd stepped inside and pulled the door to behind him. When he lifted the lantern cover, he found himself in a claustrophobic enclosure that seemed more like a deep wardrobe than the interior of a wagon. The floor and walls were smooth, planed wood that softened the lantern's harsh glow to amber. The ceiling was a bare inch above his head. To his right were layers of clothing hanging on rails, mostly silks and expensive cottons. To his left was lipped and padded shelving holding the unsold toys and devices. A narrow gangway ran the length of the wagon, less than two feet wide. Marion moved slowly forward, scuffling his shoulders against cabinets and setting hanging bric-a-brac to swinging and jangling. He passed a small cast-iron safe, a coal bunker and a trapdoor on the wooden floor that was streaked with soot, a run of shiny copper piping and valves, and more pairs of shoes than he'd ever seen in one place. At the end of the gangway was a narrow spiral staircase made of raw knotwood. Feeling like a giant in a child's house, Marion managed to squeeze up the staircase to the upper floor, although for one perilous moment he thought he'd jammed himself at the halfway mark. The upper floor was marginally more spacious, 
There was a small workbench sporting racks of precise metal tools and a lantern, as well as dozens of tiny boxes, holding all manner of springs, rods, and cogs. Beyond that was a narrow cot and bookshelves full of old and well-thumbed tomes. Rolls of yellowed paper were held against the wall with shiny brass hooks, and across from them another shelf with a row of porcelain-faced dolls. Odder and odder. But as Marion swept the bull's-eye lantern back and forth, he found nothing resembling a three-bladed knife. He gave the dolls a mistrustful glare as he passed them. Smooth, almost featureless faces with rosy lips, arched brows, and big blue glass eyes. But there was nothing childlike or innocent about them. Five of them. All in a row. And there was an unpleasant, musty odour coming from them. It smelled a bit like, Lost something, Sheriff? He almost dropped his lantern. Bertram Venn was standing behind him, smiling genially. He sure moves quiet, Marion thought. I never heard him on the staircase. Mr. Venn, he said. He wasn't an anxious man by nature, but he was suddenly very conscious of the fact that Venn stood between him and the way out. Well, this is awkward. Venn raised his eyebrows expectantly. I owe you the truth of it, I suppose, Marion continued. You'll know by now about the four cowboys I've found dead this morning. The red goatee waggled. Yes, those poor boys. It struck me as mighty peculiar the manner of their passing, almost as peculiar as your arrival the evening before. And not only that, but something else I found in their room that was, well, peculiar, offered Venn. That's it, Mr. Venn, peculiar. That's just the word I wanted. And I got to thinking to myself that so many peculiar things all fallen in the space of one day. Well, could be they might be connected. So I took it upon myself to find out. Vern bobbed his head again. His face was amiable, cool, and ultimately unreadable. Then what did you find out, Sheriff? Aside from you not being able to swing a cat in here, you mean? Not a whole hell of a lot. I see. Vern considered the floor for a moment. Well, what happens now? I suppose that depends on you, Mr. Vern, Marion countered. You got anything you want to tell me? Only that I'll do everything I can to help your investigation. Such a tragedy. Marion's attention had drifted to the shelf. Were those dolls facing me when I came in? He seemed to remember them looking towards him when he'd come up the staircase. Well, that's good to know. If I think of anything, I'll let you know. Have a good night now. He touched the brim of his hat and stepped forward. For just an instant, he thought Van was going to bar his path. But then the smaller man smiled and slid aside. Marion felt eyes on his back as he went down the stairs. Six pairs of eyes. He'd been determined to sit behind his desk and watch the wagon. He'd planned on watching it the whole night if necessary. He'd even got a pot of coffee ready to keep him awake. All he had to do was lean back in his chair with the lamp off and watch the wagon for Bertram Venn creeping out in the dead of night. He didn't remember closing his eyes, but when a rough hand shook him awake, it was pitch black outside, and he drooled down the front of his shirt. Damn it. Fell asleep in my damn chair again. Sheriff. He recognized Portmanteau's voice behind the glare of his lantern. You'd best come see this. Marion took his slicker down from its hook and made to follow his deputy, until Venn's face and the bloody bed swam into his mind. He went back to his desk drawer and took out his gun belt buckled it in place, and lifted a double-barrel scattergun from the gun rack. Portmanta watched him without a word. The body was face down in the alley between Vale's feet store and the Marley place. As Portmanto's lantern approached, Marion saw a glistening ruby slick spreading out in the mud. He didn't need to roll the corpse over. The striped shirt was enough. Oh, hell, he swore. Saw something moving in the alley mouth, Portmanto said. Otherwise, I'd never have found him till morning. It was Foster's dog. He must have smelled the blood. Marion looked down at Sam's body unhappily. The cowboys and the gold tooth had died badly, but somehow this seemed worse. Sam Ford had been a good man and a responsible member of the town. He deserved better than this. Marion caught himself thinking back to his dry office and the book sitting unfinished on his desk. It suddenly seemed very far away. Portmanteau lifted one of Sam's arms to roll him over. 
The mud gave him up reluctantly, and the dead surgeon flopped onto his back. His shirt and pants were covered in mud, but it only took seconds for them to locate the stab wound, triangular and under Sam's left pectoral, straight into the heart. Year two, Portmanteau grunted, pointing a thick finger at the back of Sam's knee where his pants were torn. Closer inspection revealed another triangular puncture. The cowboys have that. Not in the leg, Marion said, sucking his teeth as he pondered. Why stab him in the leg? The cowboys had been lying down already, but Sam must have been attacked when he walked through the alley. Whoever murdered him wanted him on the ground, but it had to stick him in the back of the knee to do it. If Venn had bushwhacked Sam, why not just stab him in the back? Why the knee? Blood's still warm, Portmanteau said, rubbing his fingers together. We have to get him off the street. We'll take him to the gold tooth and put him on one of the tables. Then I want you to wake. A loud gunshot drowned the rest of his sentence. Across the street, one of the veiled gold tooth windows on the upper floor flashed like lightning. A second and third shot followed like whip cracks, and the window blinked twice more. Marion was already running. The sucking mud in the staircase took some of the wind out of his sails, but Marion was still moving fast when he shouldered in the guest bedroom door and brought the scattergun to his shoulder. Ben Hathaway was standing in the middle of the room with his back to Marion, naked but for a pair of filthy grey socks. He was holding a revolver in his right hand, pointing it at his rumpled bed. His left was clutching his stomach. There were two black and smoking holes in the mattress that could have been mistaken for cigar burns if the room hadn't stank of gunpowder. Ben, Marion ventured when the other man didn't turn. Ben, you okay? The carpenter finally craned his head around and his eyes were large and white as hen eggs. Try to kill me, he whispered. The hand gripping his stomach was bloody, but there was no one else in the room. No one sweet bathroom in a place as ramshackle as the gold tooth. No closet or cabinet to hide in. The window was half open. Perhaps Van had... A tiny white hand appeared on the far side of the mattress. Marion stared at it dumbfounded. It was much too small to be a man's. Even a child's hand would be bigger. Just the same, it gripped the mattress and hold. A lacy bonnet followed, and then a round face, shiny and pale as milk. Big blue glass eyes, a cute button nose. The sheriff watched as the porcelain-faced doll clambered up onto the bed. It straightened to its full height and looked up at both of them. There was a round hole in the center of its chest where Ben's third bullet had struck home. A cockroach squirted out of it and scuttled away, craving a shadow to lurk in. That's one of Ven's dolls, he thought. Am I losing my mind? In its other hand, the doll clutched a long, thin object somewhere between a cactus spine and a knife. It was easily as long as the doll itself, and triple-edged like a rapier, a stabbing weapon that glinted like a razor in the lantern light. Oh, uh, Marion said. The doll marched across the mattress towards them, raising the long knife with unmistakable intent. Never one to stand on ceremony, Marion gave it both barrels of the scattergun. The double report nearly deafened him and his teeth clicked painfully from the impact against his shoulder, but the doll was blasted to shreds, spinning off the bed and slamming against the far wall. The mattress fabric exploded in his face, filling the room with a whirl of goose feathers and bits of smoldering lace. The remnants of the doll thumped to the ground out of sight behind the bed, but its carcass had left an unpleasant oily smear on the wall. When the maelstrom had begun to settle, Marion broke open the scattergun and rummaged in a pocket for spare shells. There were none. When he'd taken the scattergun, he hadn't expected to need more than two rounds. He turned to Portmanteau, but the chunky man shook his head before he could ask. Try to kill me, Ben said again. There were shouts and rapid footsteps outside, and Marion knew things would unravel quickly unless he was quicker. Port, he said. Get everyone downstairs and keep them there. Most of the town ought to be awake by now. If you see anyone on the street, tell them to spread the word. And tell them to arm themselves. I saw five of those things in Van's wagon. Right. The heavy man turned to go. In port, Marion added. If that son of a bitch shows his face, don't hesitate. Kill him. Portmanteau nodded and left. 
A second later, Marion heard him barking orders to the confused rabble flooding out of the upstairs rooms. Let me see, he said to Ben, turning the man gently with a hand. Trying to ignore his nakedness, Marion peeled back bloody fingers to examine the carpenter's abdomen. There was no neat stab wound, but rather a long, shallow slash in the flesh. It would leave a nasty scar, but wouldn't kill him. I woke up and it was standing on my chest, he said. Lucky you did, Marion said. If you hadn't moved, that thing would have skewered your heart. A couple of stitches and you'll... A dirty white hand appeared on the other side of the mattress. The doll was climbing up again, but this time its lacy clothing had been all but annihilated, and the filthy shreds that still clung to it looked more like the bandages of some miniature mummy than a child's toy. Everything else was gristle and bird bones and wire and seething movement. Marion could see beetles and maggots spilling from its insides as the animated doll got to its feet. Pellets from the scattergun had smashed the lower part of its porcelain face leaving a jagged edge that looked uncomfortably like teeth. Somehow, despite the close-range shot, the limbs of the thing were still intact, and its bright blue eyes rolled until they fixed on the two men. It raised the long knife and began to trek across the mattress again, each step pattering carapaces onto the linen. Sweet Lord, mumbled Ben. He half raised his pistol and then seemed to think better of it. Marion swung the empty scattergun by the barrels, cracking the horrid thing across the head and knocking it into the iron bed frame. It kicked and squirmed, trying to right itself and smearing black ichor onto the pillows. Out, Marion ordered, shoving the staring carpenter back to the doorway. Out, right now. Ben stumbled into the hallway, dazed and naked and still clutching his bleeding stomach. Marion had just enough presence of mind to snatch the key from the inside of the door lock before lunging out at the carpenter's back. He twisted, gripped the door handle with both hands, and slammed the door shut just as the thing was launching itself from the bed. It hit the other side of the door with a hard bang, but Marion kept the door pulled too while he jammed the key in the lock and twisted it. The door banged again. Whatever it was, he didn't like being locked in. Make sure that door stays closed, he hissed at Ben, and hurried downstairs. When he drew his revolver, he found his hands were shaking. Grizzly Dick hadn't been sleeping anyway, so the distraction was welcome. He found that the older he got, the harder it was to sleep, and the more likely he'd awake at odd hours and for unfathomable reasons. He sat up in bed, letting the thin, scratchy blanket drop to his waist. Clad in his woolly long johns, he peered around the dark cabin with a mild expectation. It wasn't uncommon for a ragged-eared old tabby to slither between the splintered boards behind his door on cold and wet nights and curl up on his bed. He hadn't done anything to discourage the animal, despite the fact it would sometimes gnaw his jerky or spray on his blanket. Truth be told, he rather enjoyed the company. The cat was content to sit on his lap and regard him with huge green lamp eyes while he did the same. Dick didn't care much for conversation, and that was an arrangement that suited the tabby just fine. But it wasn't the cat. It was a doll, about two feet high and sporting a pink lace dress and pigtails, and it was walking slowly across the shadowy floor towards him. As it passed the single cabin window, the moonlight reflected on its porcelain face and briefly illuminated big glass eyes and little cherry red lips. Oh, don't mind me, Dick muttered grumpily. You just come on in. The doll's head turned to follow him as it walked the length of his bed, its tiny round feet tapping on the floorboards. In its hand was a chunk of crystal, irregularly cut and dark as smoke. Well, well. Grizzly Dick mused, watching the doll's progress. I know what that is, sure enough. He'd seen soul stones before, charged and spent, and that one was the latter. Quite small, but then he supposed there was a limit to how much an animated doll could carry. He watched the doll reach the top of his bed, where it dropped on all fours and scuffled underneath. He heard some rustling and a clink as the soul stone was placed on the floor. By the sound, it must have been directly under him. So that's your game, he said as the doll reappeared and began to clamber up the side of his bed. You crafty little varmint. The doll made no reply. He was reminded of the cat when its big solemn glass eyes caught the moonlight again. It was now standing on the edge of his bed, 
and began to march purposefully towards him. One little fabric hand went around its back, reaching for something. Now then, Missy, Dick said conversationally as the doll drew a long, glinting knife no thicker than his pinky from the lacy folds of its dress. He must have me confused with some other old fart, because if you think I'm going to sit here and let you stick old grizzly dick with that thing... The doll's head exploded. It flew backwards off the bed while shards of porcelain and grit and bits of bone and insects rained down everywhere. Dick drew back the hammer on his ancient single-action dragoon pistol to recock it. You're dumber than I thought, he finished, and picked a squirming maggot out of his beard. The doll was thumping and clattering about on the floor in an effort to regain its feet. But it had dropped its quirky-looking knife, and Dick wasn't slow in scooping that up. Damn animated goddamn dolls, he growled, clambering out of bed and shooting the jittery toy in the chest. The forty-four caliber slug blew a fist-sized hole in the center of its body, destroying the pink dress and skittering what looked like bits of chicken vertebrae across the floor. Coming in here, making a damn mess, trying to stick me with some crazy damn knife. An old man can't get no sleep in this damn town. The last part wasn't strictly true, but Dick wasn't the sort of man to let a truth get in the way of a good gripe. He shot the doll again, sending it sliding across the floor to thump against the wall. There was a slick of something black and unpleasant on the boards. Look at that damn mess, he grouched. And who's going to have to clean that up? That's right, old Grizzly Dick with his creaky joints and his bad back. Down on my damn knees like an old washerwoman. Damn animated dolls. He shot it again to emphasize his displeasure. The doll, now a ragged, indecipherable mass of jittering parts and black smears, didn't seem to know which way was up. Beetles and worms were swarming from the broken thing like rats deserting a sinking ship. Thought you'd do me in and fill that stone up, did you? He snorted. Well, that didn't work out so good, did it? Guess your boss didn't figure an old raccoon like me would put up much of a fight. He lifted a galvanized metal bucket and dropped it over the squirming thing and sat on it. He could feel the doll's struggles, but his weight, scrawny as he was, proved too great to budge. Yeah, he chuckled, breaking open the pistol to check the remaining rounds. Bet you didn't think you'd be trapped in a bucket when you got up this morning, did you? The bumping and struggling continued unabated. Probably as good a time as any to mention I don't got no outhouse, he said. Don't need one when I got me a bucket. Marion had come to the conclusion that the dolls just wouldn't die. After getting most of the townsfolk into the gold tooth, he had been forced to station another two men at the door to Ben's room. The thing inside had been resolutely stabbing at the door since he'd locked it, and the wood was already beginning to splinter. They'd found another one downstairs. It had attacked Young and stabbed him through the hand before he'd been able to knock it away. Portmanteau had pinned it to the saloon floor with a pickaxe, and there it remained, twisting and straining mutely to get at them. Its big, expressionless glass eyes followed them wherever they went, while it lay in a creeping puddle of black ichor. The lights in the saloon were better and Marion had been able to get a look at what was under their lacy clothing. Chicken bones and metal wire and other less identifiable things formed the limbs. The fabric fingers tore away to reveal jagged metal points. The body seemed to be a bag of wet soil swarming with life. Pulpy white worms and glistening chitin bugs welled steadily from the pickaxe wound. The doll itself seemed none the worse for being impaled. Its tiny hands wrestled with the axe blade. Tiny legs drummed on the floor. Porter tried stamping on its head to kill it, but only succeeded in cracking its porcelain face. That thing is unholy, Ivy said as she wound a towel around Young's bleeding hand. We should take it outside and burn it. We will, Marion said, when we find the rest of them. We'll have ourselves a bonfire. The townsfolk were huddled as far from the doll as they could get seated around the tables at the far end of the room and were as quiet as nervous cows, all pale faces and big eyes. Most of them were in nightshirts and long johns. Only a few had the presence of mind to bring a weapon, but that suited Marion fine. Jumpy men and guns were poor bedfellows. 
He was about to order portmanteau to gather a dozen likely men into a posse to comb the town for Van, when the one thing he hadn't expected happened. The swaggering inventor stepped in through the saloon doors. Good evening, Sheriff, he said. Marion didn't hesitate. He drew his pistol aimed and fired. The gun report was loud, but not so loud as to completely mask the metallic spang of the bullet striking Ben's chest. The red goateed man was knocked back a step but otherwise seemed untroubled. A wisp of smoke curled from the finger-sized hole in his waistcoat. Just seem upset, he said pleasantly. Marion fired again. A second shot into Ben's chest. A second spang, and this time the bullet ricocheted and smashed a bottle behind the bar. What the hell is this? A murmur of disbelief rippled through the townsfolk. If I might be allowed to, Ven began, Port! A good thing about Portmanteau was that he was always able to predict the sheriff's next thought. He fired his scattergun, hitting the unnatural vendor square in the chest and blasting him backwards into the swing doors. Ven was almost propelled out into the street, but managed to grab onto the doors, leaning back on the porch like a drunk. He found his balance, grinning ruefully at the deputy as he came back into the lamplight. Now, now, deputy, he scolded gently. Is that any way to treat an honored guest? The front of his waistcoat and silk shirt had been shredded. Underneath was a brass plate shaped and sculpted into the likeness of a human torso. The burnished metal was dimpled and dented from the bullet impacts, but otherwise undamaged. What the hell are you? Marion growled. You're genius, Ben said casually. At his back, two moon-faced dolls slipped under the swing doors and moved to their master's flanks. Both carried thin blades and both had copious bloodstains on their linen dresses. At their arrival, Ben glanced down, and a wide grin split his features. Ah, Elsbeth and Dominique, don't be shy, come in. I see by your gowns you have something for me. They both raised their free hands. Marion caught a glitter of something as each doll passed Ven a small stone that sparkled with an inner light. Oh, how delightful. Well done, my dears. Ben raised one soul stone between thumb and forefinger and examined it. Yes, very well done indeed. You're a fool if you think you're going to get out of this alive, Marion said, although in truth he'd expected two pistol rounds and a scattergun cartridge to have done the trick. Alive? Ben looked disappointed. Sheriff, clearly you have no idea what you're dealing with. Besides, by morning there will be no one left to tell the tale, now that you've kindly gathered most of the town into one place for me. My girls have already cleaned up the rest. What are those things? Ven continued as if he hadn't heard. I usually prefer to take my time, you know. A body here, a body there. It usually takes weeks for people to figure out who's doing the killing. I must say I was quite disconcerted when I found you looking at my dolls earlier this evening. I didn't think you'd make the connection quite so quickly. So I thought it'd be safer to finish you all off tonight. He smiled charmingly. You're really much too smart for your own good. I still can't believe you think you can kill over 30 people all by yourself. Well, seeing is believing, as they say, Ben said. I admit I may not look the type, but there is more to me than meets the eye. Very much more. As a matter of fact, I might go so far as to... A metal bucket clanged down over Ben's head, muffling the rest of his sentence. Well, don't you just stand there gawping, snapped Grizzly Dick as he kicked one of the dolls across the room. Give an old man a hand, why don't you? Time for a message from our sponsors. Tales of Malifaux on the Breachside Broadcast is brought to you this week by a revolutionary new idea for saving scrip. Looting the dead. That's right, looting the dead. Instead of paying for it yourself, have you considered simply taking what you want from the still warm corpse of your foes? Give it a go. You'll never know what you might find. A coop necklace, a strange metal shirt, a sneak's cloak, maybe even a soul stone with, if you follow the method of making the person dead prior to looting them, a cheeky free charge in it. Who knows? The person you're looting from, that's for sure. Not that they'll be in any state to tell you. Think about it, it's an untapped, ethically grey resource. Someone's treasure could be your treasure instead. It's all that easy with looting the dead. Now to bring a long night in Red Road to a close.
Marion and Portmanteau were the first to leap into the fray, but others quickly followed. Grizzly Dick clung to the bucket like a drowning sailor as Venn staggered around the saloon, his howls of protest echoing hollowly. Despite the sheriff, his deputy, and three others trying to wrestle the inventor to the ground, they found their opponent had the advantage in strength. His limbs were hard as iron, and when a flapping hand gripped Tom Silver's, it squeezed so hard his collarbone snapped. What's the matter with you fools? Grizzly Dick was shouting as Tom fell away. Get the stones out of him! Marion's brain was in turmoil, and old Dick wasn't making any sense. No matter how hard they heaved, they couldn't seem to overpower the stocky merchant. More townsfolk rushed forward to help, but Van's flapping arms cracked one man across the head, knocking him senseless, and shoved another so high he skidded twenty feet on his backside and knocked over a stack of chairs. The stones, you damn fools, Grizzly Dick was rasping, his oversized boots trailing as he was dragged along after the blind, flailing inventor. The stones! The other people were trying to keep Ven's malevolent dolls at bay. Ivy was repeatedly slapping one with a broom she'd fished from behind the bar, and the other had been pinned to the wall with a chair held by two women. It was busy hacking at the legs while they screamed. A rock-hard elbow slammed into Marion's chest, and the world spun violently. He found himself crumpled against the bar with stars winking in his eyes and a weight pressing against his lungs like an anvil. As he watched, Ven threw off another two men. Only Portmanteau and Grizzly Dick remained. One of the buttons holding up the trapdoor of Dick's long johns had popped off, and the old man's skinny butt flashed as he dropped to his knees finally relinquishing his hold on the bucket handle, just as the deputy was peeled off and thrown across the room like an old coat. Van yanked the offending bucket off his head and crushed it, his face a mask of indignant fury. Grizzly Dick's night soil had smeared the pompous inventor's face, and his sharp crimson goatee now looked like someone had used it to grease a wagon axle. How dare you, he hissed, swinging around to tower over the wrinkly prospector. For this outrage, I shall... Dick reached up and yanked on his chest plate. The brass front levered open on two articulated arms, and a star-shaped metal disc fell out of the cavity behind, hitting the hard floor between Dick's knees. The winking stones that nestled in its recessed surface scattered in every direction, bouncing like glass dice. Van opened his mouth to scream, but only managed a ghostly sigh. His legs buckled and he sat down hard, almost splintering the floorboards with his weight. Around him the dolls collapsed, marionettes with their strings cut. Ivy continued to beat hers with the broom, nevertheless. Marion could feel broken ribs grating in his chest. Dick, he asked. Not so tough now, are you? the prospector grunted, getting slowly to his feet. Inside Van's open chest, wheels and levers could be seen moving, and behind those... Twin pumps working up and down. The mechanisms were slowing, though. Their momentum was draining away. Not like this, Ven whispered, as his arms dropped to his sides, hands open and lifeless. Not like this. I'm a genius. His head slumped forward as a last weak hiss of air escaped him. First mad bucket, muttered Grizzly Dick, shuffling over to inspect it with one corner of his trapdoor hanging like a dog's tongue. Damn mechanical damn son of a bitch. Portmanteau sat up with a groan, scattering broken furniture. Townsfolk went to help him to his feet. Dick, Marion said again, how did you know? It was the stones, Dick said, scratching himself. The soul stones. He was... The old man grasped for the words, making unclear gestures. He was taking the life out of others and putting it in himself. As soon as I saw that doll putting the stone under my bed, I knew it. Marion remembered the lake of blood under the cowboy's bed and the four gaps. That's where it all came from, Dick continued, 
the kitty toys, those dogs, even his own damn body. It all ran off the life he'd been sucking out of other folks. Must have been doing it for years, like a, a damn vampire. Well, you sure showed him, Dick, Ivy piped up before looking at the inert doll suspiciously and swatting it away with her broom. Damn right I did, the old man grunted. Marion felt very tired and very bemused, but there was one thing left to do. One thing he'd promised to himself when this whole mess hit the fan. He used the bar to get himself upright and began to shuffle painfully to the door, holding his chest. Where you going, chief? asked Portmanteau. I'll be back, he said, pushing through the doors. The others looked at each other. Daphne Poltroon watched the glinting knife coming closer and closer. She screamed again, but it was useless. There was no one to hear her plight. And then a shape came out of the mist directly behind Osmond. He was given an almighty shove, and his vindictive grin dissolved into a startled gasp as he toppled over the edge of the cliff. Daphne heard him shriek all the way down. A strong hand reached for her, and she latched to it with all her strength. She felt herself being lifted and suddenly muscular arms were being wrapped around her, and a handsome face filled her vision, brimming with concern. It was Blake, dashing, modest Blake Farrenhall, the groundskeeper. Oh, Daphne, he cried, are you injured? What did that beast do to you? You saved me, Daphne breathed, her limbs turning to water in his passionate embrace. I thought I would surely die, Daphne. Oh, Daphne, I love you, Blake blurted, squeezing her tighter still. I love you. I know I'm only a groundskeeper and have no manor or lands to offer you, but my heart and soul are yours to do with as you will. Oh, Blake, my heart swells at your words. I love you also and as well. You do? Say you'll marry me, sweet, sweet Daphne. Take my hand and we shall live together in my cottage as husband and wife. I wish only that I could give you the home you deserve. Oh, Blake, but now that evil Oswald has gone, I am come into my inheritance. We shall have money and lands and more besides. Oh, happy day. Oh, Daphne. Oh, Blake. Oh, Daphne. Marion closed the cliffs of Appleby and smiled to himself. Finally, he said to no one in particular. The next morning, the sheriff went to fully investigate Ben's wagon, but it had disappeared. Assuming the conflict had not, in fact, come to an end, he quickly began searching the town for Ben and his dogs. He soon found Pat Milliken's boy, Pete, who said he awoke to the sound of clanking gears outside his window deep in the night, and looked out to see the wagon roll out of town. The boy said it looked like Ben's wagon, but the words on its side were different. There was a pasted poster, hung crooked in apparent haste or laziness, of a marionette's wooden head painted in shades of purple and blue, with the words, Collodi's Miniature Carnival. Thankful to have the accursed business put behind him, and not knowing who else to warn, Marion decided to retire to Young's for a much-deserved drink. Mr. Vertrim Venn will be visiting your town very soon. Bringing along a bit of this and a touch of that, Mr. Venn's painted caravan can play host to any number of occasions. Selling the old snake oil, children's parties, or just fixing the broken wheel on your cart. Gaze in awe at his small wooden friends. Try as you might, you'll see no strings on them. They're only puppets, I hear you cry. Ben, like any good magician, would not be one to divulge his stagecraft. More than just little helpers, the wooden friends are prone to the odd performance or two. You might even get lucky and see a show. Coming up next on Ben's tour is the town of Honesty, 
Do let us know what he's like there, listeners. And that's all we have time for. Stay safe out there, listeners, because bad things happen.